continue our examination of the biography of the Messenger of God Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Mecca and we reach a very challenging time for the Prophet and Bani Hashim and most Muslims. The Quraysh realize that nothing is working. They tried every way to stop the Prophet from preaching the religion of Islam, they failed. The Prophet is getting stronger, Islam is getting stronger by the second. So they come up with a new strategy. They gather at Dar al Nadwa, which was a house in Mecca. They used to gather in that house for high level meetings. And they're developing a new strategy. Now the Bani Hashim were still powerful. They realized that if we mess with Bani Hashim, a civil war might break out. So if any one tribe commits acts of aggression against the Bani Hashim, there, this might get out of control and there might be a civil war. So they come up with this idea and strategy. To avoid having any single tribe responsible, they make an agreement that all of us Meccan tribes, we shall boycott Bani Hashim. We shall impose a full embargo, boycott on all members of Bani Hashim. What is Bani Hashim going to do? They can't go to war with every tribe, that's not possible. So that's a good way to either contain Islam or to force them to what? Relinquish their faith and come back to our religion and be pagans. So they come up with this collective boycott. They tell the Muslims, look, either you follow us, stop on this, stop with this new religion, or hand us over Muhammad and we'll, we'll deal with him. But you can't continue like that. If you continue like this, we shall impose a full embargo on some Muslims and specifically the Bani Hashim and we'll make you starve to death. So this is serious, we'll make you starve to death. And no one will be responsible in particular because all tribes came up with this idea. They sign a document, 40 of them, 40 high-ranking members of Quraysh, they sign a document to impose this ban. These are the points they mention in the document. Number one, there shall be no more marrying between the tribes. So no person from Bani Hashim is allowed to marry a woman from another tribe and no man from another tribe will marry a woman from Bani Hashim. That's it, there's a complete ban on marriages. No marriages from now on, that's number one. Number two, do not sell them anything or buy anything from them. Complete economic embargo. Number three, don't make any sort of deal or agreement with them. Number four, let's look at the opponents of Muhammad. Let's support his opponents in any way possible. So if there's anyone from anywhere who has enmity with Muhammad, let's support them. Let them try to bring him down. So they gather in Dar al Nadwa, 40 high ranking men, and they actually sign this document. And they agreed that whoever violates this document, this, you know, a binding document that we're signing on, will be killed. So it was serious. No tribe would dare break this agreement because they would be killed. They agreed on that. It was drafted by, by a Meccan man called Mansur ibn Akrama. He's the one who drafted this document, meaning he wrote it. Now they all sealed it with their personal seals. At the time, if you were high ranking, you had a personal seal in order to prove that this is your signature. They all sealed it. These 40 men, they sealed this document. What they did initially, they took this document, they hung it on the Kaaba for everyone to witness and see. But then after a, while, after a while they were concerned, you know, what if a thief comes and he steals the document, we need to protect it somewhere safe. So they take the document to the house of Abu Jahl's mother. 
Abu Jahl had a mother, they decided to take this document to the house of his mother and she would keep it there in somewhere that is safe and well protected, completely sealed, no one can open it. They make this agreement. This was in the year six to seven after the birth of the Prophet. So we're talking about six to seven years after the Prophet receives revelation. This incident happens. Abu Talib, when he hears about this document, he orders all members of Bani Hashim to go in Sha'b Abi Talib, the valley of Abu Talib. The valley of Abu Talib was an important piece of land right across from Masjid al Haram. It was an important piece of land that the Bani Hashim had inherited from their grandfathers. There's a long story behind how they got that piece of land but it was the, the place to be in Mecca. The prime location in Mecca was just outside of Masjid al-Haram. There was you know, a valley right by Masjid al-Haram called Sha'b Abi Talib, the valley of Abu Talib. The Prophet's house with Lady Khadija was there. The Prophet himself, he was born there. So it was an important area for Bani Hashim. It was the hub for Bani Hashim. By the way, today, you know, the authorities in Mecca have completely destroyed that valley and the house of the Prophet The last time I went to Hajj, there was a market called Suq al-Layl. Some of you may have gone to it, Suq al-Layl they call it over there. Um, it's one of those bazaars that are very close to Masjid al-Haram. That was still in Sha'b Abi Talib. But I think now they've demolished it and they've constructed, you know, high-rise buildings over there or most of the valley has been annexed to Masjid al-Haram. When they expanded Masjid al-Haram, you know, that expansion included the valley of Abu Talib. So Ab Abu Talib, he commands the members of Bani Hashim that this document is aimed at us. It specifically mentions Bani Hashim to be boycotted. So let's all gather here, let's be close to each other so we keep each other safe. The only person from Bani Hashim not to attend and go with them was who, obviously? Abu Lahab, the brother of Abu Talib, the uncle of the Prophet, because he was one of the pagan mobilizers against the Prophet. So obviously he was not included in this deal because he was amongst those who were instigating against the Prophet. Yes. Uh, what about Abbas? Abbas ibn Abd al-Muttalib, even though at this time he was a pagan, but we don't have indications that Abbas took any measures against the Prophet. He was neutral. He didn't support the Prophet like Abu Talib. Neither was he anti, you know, Islam and persecuting Muslims and condemning the Prophet like Abu Lahab. So maybe he was in the valley. There are indications he probably was in the valley, but he was just not involved. You know, he was neutral. Because the historical accounts tell us all of Bani Hashim were in the valley except Abu Lahab. So maybe we can deduce from that that he was also, um, you know, in the valley or possibly but maybe you just had the freedom to come and go. It's also possible he was not in the valley, so we don't exactly know. But he was mainly neutral. Abu no, Abu Lahab. Yeah, Abu Sufyan is from Bani Umayyah, the, the, the rivals of Bani Hashim. Abu Lahab was the only member of Bani Hashim who did not join them in Sha'ab Abi Talib because he was a disbeliever and the Quran had already condemned him. So Abu Sufyan, no, he's, he wasn't from Bani Hashim. So this Sha'b Abi Talib is just by the mountain of Abu Qubais, which overlooks the Kaaba. And this boycott continued for three years. For th three years, there was a severe embargo on those early Muslims, specifically from the members of Bani Hashim. They assigned monitors, the pagans, to see if anyone's breaking the boycott, is anyone delivering to them food, assistance? They would actually assign monitors, spies, round the clock to make sure no one violates this treaty. Abu Talib also assigned monitors to let Muslims know if there's a sudden attack, someone comes trying to kill the Prophet, at least we know, we can prepare. So there were monitors from both sides. Abu Talib had placed monitors for the safety of Muslims. The pagans had implanted spies and monitors in order to see if anyone breaks the treaty. So how did they survive during those three years in such persecution? 
Remember, none of them can work. You can't buy, you can't sell, you can't work. You're stuck in a valley. And remember, when we say valley, it wasn't like this big valley. It's just a, a piece of property by Masjid al-Haram. So how did they survive? Now we know why the Prophet ﷺ states Islam was built on the sword of Ali and what? The wealth of Khadija. It's the wealth of Lady Khadija that saved the Bani Hashim and those early Muslims. In fact, it was during those three years that her wealth finished. Because now nobody can work. There is a complete embargo. And Bani Hashim were not rich. Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet, he, he was richer than the other uncles. But Bani Hashim were not known to be rich. So their only source of wealth and funding really during those three years was the wealth of Lady Khadija alayhi salam. And that's why to honor Lady Khadija for all this wealth later, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the land of Fadak to the Prophet, He instructs the Prophet in the Holy Quran, Surah Al-Isra, verse 26, وَآتِ And give your nearest of kin, meaning your daughter Fatima, حَقَّهِ their right. The Prophet tells his daughter Fatima alayhi salam that your, your mother Khadija, through her wealth, she sacrificed a lot for the religion of Islam. And, I, and Jibra'il has commanded me to pay her back. So I'm giving the land of Fadak to you. Remember, it was a very, uh, you know, uh, highly valued piece of land, very expensive piece of land. It would generate 120,000 golden dinars every year. That was a lot of money. You could buy a sheep with one dinar. So you do the math. Today, a sheep is about 100 to 200 dollars. Multiply that by 120,000 sheep. That's a lot of money. We're talking about millions of dollars in today's money. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the Prophet, give the land of Fadak to Fatima to honor her mother Khadija. Why? Because she was the only surviving inheritor of Lady Khadija. She didn't have any other surviving children at the time. Lady Fatima was the only surviving child of Lady Khadija. So Jibra'il says to the Prophet, now you've become rich because the Prophet was poor his entire life. So he couldn't pay back Khadija. Allah tells him, now you've got a piece of land, give it to Fatima. Now, Lady Khadija is spending from her wealth. When her wealth finishes, it runs out. They start eating grass, desert plants, just to keep themselves surviving. In fact, situation, the situation got so bad, children would starve would literally starve. The pagans would hear children crying out of starvation and hunger. That's how bad it got in the valley of Abu Talib. Those pagans who would hear, some of them would feel happy, rejoiced. Yeah, Muhammad and his people deserve this. See, they didn't listen to us. Now they're starving to death. While other pagans who had a better heart, they felt saddened. You know, kids are starving. Come on. You know, we're being very cruel towards the Bani Hashim. So there were some who would sympathize, but remember, they didn't want to violate the document which they signed on. Now the Muslims wouldn't dare leave this land, this valley, except in two months. The month of Rajab, you had the Umrah, where people came from all over the Arabian Peninsula to do their Umrah. The Muslims were, un were allowed under very strict circumstances to come to Masjid al-Haram and do their Umrah, and also in the Hajjah at the time of Hajj. They would come and do their hajj. Now this presented the Muslims a small window of opportunity to do some business. So what did the pagans do? And Abu Jahl, he was the leader of this movement. They would go and announce in Masjid al-Haram by the Sa'i, any newcomer who would come, oh people, don't do business with Bani Hashim. If you want to sell them anything, we'll pay double what Bani Hashim would pay. Just don't sell them. They inflated the prices so that Bani Hashim could not buy anything, buy or sell anything. That's how bad it got. They were willing to pay double and triple to those visitors who would come just so they would deny Bani Hashim from buying food. Yes. Um, you said the two months, uh, Rajab and Dhul Hajjah. Rajab is for the Umrah, Rajabiyyah, and Dhul Hajjah was for the Hajj.
These were the only two exceptions. Other than that, they really did not um, have a chance to do any business. So even to that point, you just want to buy food, you can. You know, when you read these events, brothers and sisters, sometimes, honestly, because maybe of our religion, for the sisters, because of the hijab, sometimes you feel you don't have as many economic opportunities. Maybe you need to go to more interviews to be accepted. And you see many people giving up their faith. Look at these early Muslims, three years, starvation, starvation, they did not give up their religion. That's really a lesson for us. What we go through is not one thousandth of what they went through. And yet, oh no, it's difficult to be a Muslim, the hijab is an impediment, I can't get the job I want as quickly as I want and so on and so forth. Look at those early Muslims, what they had to go through, three years, it's not three days or three months, three years seeing children cry. Can you handle seeing a child cry from starvation? Can you? You can't watch that scene. Imagine what the Prophet and the Muslims, the psychological pain they had to go through before the physical pain. But they remained steadfast in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We really live like kings in heaven compared to what those early Muslims had to go through. So the end goal was to make Muslims suffer until they'd give up or hand over the Prophet. That was their goal. Now how did they get food during those three years? We know that Lady Khadija was funding, but remember they had monitors. So how did they manage to get food inside the valley? There are two ways. The first way was through the efforts of Imam Ali salam. He would secretly take the wealth of Lady Khadija, he would secretly go outside, in secrecy, he would make some deals and transactions with some fair people in Mecca and he would deliver the food. But he had to do this very secretly because had they caught him taking food, they would have definitely ap attempted to kill him. So this was a big sacrifice on behalf of Amir al-Mu'mineen to put himself in that situation. So this was one way. Another way through which they would get food is through the nephew of Lady Khadija, Hukaym ibn Hazam. Hukaym ibn Hazam was a pagan, he did not become a Muslim, but Lady Khadija was his aunt. So historians tell us that he would deliver food to the valley of Abu Talib. Once Abu Jahl noticed him, and he put a fight with him. He told him, what are you doing carrying food? Because he was carrying food with a servant. They were carrying food to the valley of Abu Talib. He told him, what exactly are you doing? He says, no, I'm just carrying food to my aunt. Because Lady Khadija was his aunt and it was her money, right? So I'm just carrying money to my aunt. He's like, no, 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 that's not gonna fly. You're, ta you're, you're taking money for the Muslims. And there was a physical fight over there that happened, you know, uh, the, the others had to get involved to stop the fight. So, these were the, the, the ways through which the Muslims would get their food. Primarily through the efforts of Imam Ali salam, secretly leaving, for example, in the darkness of the night, he would leave to get some food for the Muslims and also the nephew of Lady Khadija salam, Hukaym ibn Hazam. Abu Talib during these three years, he was so concerned about the Prophet. Every night when the Prophet was about to sleep, Abu Talib, when others slept, he would change the place of the Prophet. So he would not be known where he would be sleeping because he was concerned maybe somebody ambushes us right now and attacks the Prophet. So every night when he sees others sleeping, he changes the bed of the Prophet. It wasn't a bed, he was sleeping on the ground, but you know his place. That's number one. Number two, he would have all of his sons, you know, Imam Ali alayhi salam and his other sons, he would have them sleep around the Prophet, having the Prophet in the middle and the others around the Prophet Now who would sleep in the Prophet's bed, which was normally his bed? Imam Ali salam. He would tell him, you go sleep in the Prophet's bed so that if someone comes and attacks the Prophet thinking the Prophet is there, you'll be there to defend. So Abu Talib was really so concerned about the 
um, you know, life of the Prophet, he would surround his own sons around the Prophet to protect his life. Now there's an interesting question over here, we've examined these three gruesome years, did you hear any mention in Muslim history about one, two, three, where were they? those supposedly great companions who became caliphs, what happened to them? Did they sacrifice? Did they starve? Did they go through this? They went through none of this. They had the freedom, come in, come out. They were supposedly Muslims, yeah. They were Muslims at the time because remember this is the year 6-7 of Hijrah. Abu Bakr definitely had embraced Islam. Omar is disputable. Sunnis believe yes, at this time he was Muslim. We have differences of opinion. Some of our scholars state he became Muslim later um, before the Hijrah of the Prophet. Others say no, in the sixth year of Hijrah, right before maybe these incidents, um, like a few months before this incident, he did become Muslim. Remember, Bani Hashim were initially targeted by this boycott. So Abu Bakr and Umar, they were not targeted by this boycott. They did not go through these sacrifices. In fact, we don't find them even in Sunni sources, bringing one plate of food to the Muslims. And in Sunni sources, they acknowledge the three-year boycott? Oh yes, this is uh, what I mentioned to you is mainly from Sunni sources, yes. Ibn Ishaq uh, narrates this incident, you have uh, Al-Bidaya wa Nihaya, a a Sunni book that talks about these events. Oh yes, they do recognize this. Now their argument when you ask them, okay, where were your leaders? They're like, well, they weren't targeted by the boycott, so what do you want them to do? Bani Hashim were specifically targeted. Okay, fine, they weren't targeted. How come they didn't help? How come they did not help? When you see children starving, the Prophet going hungry for days, you don't deliver food? Even if your life will be in danger, then where's your sacrifice? It's all benefiting? Then where's the sacrifice? Where is the sacrifice? You don't find a single historical account, even a weak hadith that states one day, one night, they tried to bring a tray of food to the Muslims. What were they doing during those three years? And then they represent the Prophet and Imam Ali who would sleep in the Prophet's bed every night. He would secretly, you know, jeopardize his own life by going out in the darkness of the night getting food. They make him number four. In any case, yes. Um, it's kind of irrelevant, but I kind of wanted to know the chronology of the nights of the Prophet that Islam believed in. Would he go to sleep and then wake up in the middle of the night and then try to find someone to buy from? Or would he do that? So obviously, the Imam salam would leave at a time when most people were sleeping. Remember, back then there was no electricity, so most people were sleeping at 12, 1 a.m., right? So we could assume that after people had slept, the Imam alayhi salam, you know, had made himself appear to be sleeping in the Prophet's bed. Then when things quiet down, um, the Imam alayhi salam would secretly go outside and bring some food to them. But remember, he was jeopardizing his life. Why? Because there were monitors. So he had to be very careful not to make a noise, take the appropriate route, know where the monitors are standing because uh, the pagans had actually Uh, you know, appointed monitors 